weather, I understand. But let's let's get winter here so we can get some of the stuff pros and off and, and not have to deal with it. Um, we want to keep in mind the prayer requests, needs, and concerns this morning as uh, we, we go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, and at the same time, we're, we're very thankful. I know for one, just having the opportunity to be here this morning and worship together. This is a blessing. God intends His people to be united and to be here on Sunday morning. And, and, and these times are very important for us. And we cherish that. Uh, we think of our missionaries and those that we support. And when we have uh, several thanks. I know the Navajo Christian uh, churches and the mission we support there sends their regards and appreciates the, the donation as well as Butler Springs and community health. But we think of the Bondies and the Dryans. Uh, we think of our brothers and sisters around the globe. We want to keep Brad Chapman in our prayers. He departed this morning. So Jeannie's Berry, pins and needles, uh, departed this morning. Has to wait a little bit before he is able to cross the border, so there's a little time gap there. But uh, ahead of schedule, but he's going to be on the mission field in, in Bethsheba, uh, a missionary group that we're going to keep posted uh, on, on his uh, working works there, and we'll have that on the board. But we need to keep in prayer our missionary. We're blessed to be a church that supports our missions. God's been good to us, and uh, we want to make uh, sure that in turn we are utilizing what God's given us and make sure the gospel spread everywhere. But we have a job to do with our neighbors and friends and family as we, we do our best to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let, let's open with prayer, and uh, we, will, we will begin uh, the festivities this morning. Father, we come before you so very blessed for <coughs> another day of life to give us. And we are reminded every day uh, of the wonderful privilege we have to be your children, uh, to know that we uh, have the, the guilt of sin, the penalty of sin, but you stepped in to take our place, and we live a life of freedom in you. I pray that in what we say and do, at work, at home, at school, everywhere, may we shine your light for all to see. And Father, this church, as an entity in this community, and, and abroad, uh, with supporting missionaries and outreach, and, and just doing our very best to spread your word, use us, Father. May we be willing to be used by you, and let your word work in us, and, and be the best workers we can be for your kingdom. I pray for this church, Father, as we move forward, as this year uh, continues to get into the swing of things, and we enter the second month of 2012, when we think of how quickly time flies by. We see the activities planned, not in our youth program, but, but uh, other organizations and committees in the church. And Father, whatever we, we seek to do, uh, may we be prayerful about it, may we be thoughtful, and may we make sure that you are receiving the glory and, and honor, no matter what it is we do. And Father... Uh, just be with the list this morning, the prayer list, needs and concerns, whether those who are undergoing surgeries, those who are preparing for surgery, or recovering, Father, even unspoken requests. It seems there are so many needs and concerns, but you are a mighty God, and you tell us that no matter the burden we have, we bring it before you, and let all of us remember that, no matter what is on our hearts this morning, as we seek you. Be with us for the service. Uh, may may uh, we open our hearts and minds and be receptive to what your word has to say to us. Father, we love you. We thank you as your son's precious name we pray. Amen. That would be uh, Denise Bryant. It's a thank you card. Having a uh, carpal tunnel surgery this past week. And then we want to keep her in prayers this Thursday. She's going to be having surgery in Kennery. So uh, we are on her back. So we remember Denise Bryant. We remember Bird Chat. And Bird's with us. Uh, the 16th will be having arm surgery. Uh, David, Aaron, the next one will be having surgery at. <coughs> so, uh, but it's good to see Bird with us. So we keep that in mind. Uh, Sunday school was 52. Uh, it was 70 last week, which I wasn't here. I don't know if that tells me something. Uh, so it's wonderful to be back. Uh, good luck. No, but uh, hopefully we can see that number increase. Uh, before we continue, John Williams has uh, minutes from the board meeting to present. So. Good morning. This is a recap of the February 1st, 2012 board meeting. Ken Driscoll presented his youth report. There were 14 youth at the first adventure presentation in January. The program for February adventure session is being played. The trustees report was given by Greg Thomas. A new sump pump and switch were installed in the basement, and the pump is helping reduce the water problem in the basement. The truck is still being repaired. The sign in front of the church is being repaired, but it needs a new title. Greg scheduled a walk around for April 17th. Projected cost to run the electric from, to the garage and shelter house with 200 amp service is $1,166.71. Brad Klaus gave his minister's report and asked for time off of February 10th and again for February 20th and 21st. 
request was granted. Letters were received from Athena and Brianna Kinsley and Sage Strieber requesting $500 each from the scholarship fund. Motion was carried to grant the request. A letter was received from, from Betty Schaefer's estate leaving the church 20% of her estate to be used for the youth program. <clears throat> Bob Curtis gave the elders a report and motion was made and passed for the church to cover any excess expenses for the busy bees that the busy bees may incur for the February 14th dinner. The sound system is, is to be checked by the original vendor and the damage for the electrical storm. Estimates are being obtained to repair the stained glass windows. Updating the auditorium with new carpet and pews was discussed. A group is going to South Bloomfield Monday, February 6th, to look at pews. A letter from Brad Chapman was received requesting financial help for his mission to trip to Mexico. Since the budget for missions has been approved for the year, no action was taken. However, the elders asked if the Sunday school classes could help. Gary Evans gave the deacon's report. He stated that the next deacon's meeting is scheduled for Sunday, February 19th, after the morning services. In other business, Gary Evans asked about what we pay guest speakers. The motion was made and passed to pay guest speakers $100 per message or $150 for morning and evening services. Under old business, window in Brad's office has been installed. The carpet and the rock is to be cleaned. Under new business, the first feasibility study of church property is to be done February 2nd. Finance committee to meet next week. You may obtain a copy of the board of names in the church office. At this point, I would like to recognize a group of members that have been faithfully and diligently meeting and working to further the church to better serve you and God. This group of 10 people have been meeting about once a week since October 6, 2011. This group is known as your Building and Improvements Committee. I would like each of them to stand, <coughs> stand and be recognized as I read their names. Brad Klaus, Brad and Mary Beth Cochran, Bob Curtis, Sue Davis, Jeff and Courtney Hoke, Skyler Strieber, Don Williams, and myself. If anyone has a suggestion to improve the fight facilities of the church, please contact one of these people. I thank you very much.
whole new understanding of what their role in the church and in school and in the world really is. Because junior high is a rough time for some of them. They're just finding out who they are and what they're going to be doing. So pray for the junior high and for me and Brad and Sarah and everybody else that is going as shops that we are able to have patience that we get with them. And that um, we also come back with a new understanding of everything. So then let's go ahead and greet one another.
I'm not supposed to tell on myself, but, but I did Roseanne last week, and then she kind of gave me another answer, which I hadn't thought about. Recently, I've gotten a job uh, teaching at Wellington Middle School, and uh, I noticed that it's taken away a lot of my time from reading the Bible. I said, oh, well, no, please don't let the Lord have our voice know that, or grab it, or even anybody else, because, you know, we have high expectations for each and every one of us. And Rosanna said, maybe there's a reason that you're at that middle school. Maybe that is going to be some uh, testimony uh, for all these kids. And as we uh, discuss some things throughout the classes, I realized that, yes, there are a lot of things these students need to know. Um, just recently, some of the students said, Mr. Curtis, what are you going to do by the end of 2012 here when the world ends? And, and I stand firmly said, what do you mean? I know 2012 world's going to end. Well, the book that's out, and, you know, I think it's, I believe, the Mayan calendar they're referring to. And I said, well, I go back to Scripture. I said, in the Bible, it doesn't tell us the day, the hour, or anything when uh, the world is going to end. So I at least can at times when students ask me questions or bring things up, I can plug and get the Word of God in there in the Bible. So I do take advantage of it. I won't, you know, step across any you know, state versus school districts, but when I can plug the Word of the Bible, I do it. And I think I'm getting across to someone that way. And there are so many lost, I think, they're children yet, so they have to the age of accountability. But I worry about so many of them not knowing the word. That it means our job's got to be even tougher here. We've got to get out there, and not only with the, the children, but, you know, if they're lost, I'm sure their home lives and parents have to be lost too, not knowing the word. So please, do what you can. People do watch us. We, we, we've mentioned that several times. And, and we are uh, a shining light, as Brad always mentions, it's part of that. We are the shining light uh, of God's word. And we've got to show that and do the best that we can, always. Because I think we can make it. Uh, I know we can't make a difference. I don't think. I know we can't make a difference. No kind of mind. I'm trying to keep my voice down today. Let me, <clears throat> for Rosanna, she wanted to put up with this mouth at the weekend, but I want to try to save it because I'd like to be at school tomorrow and be able to talk to them. So I've just chosen a couple things to read from you and share with you <clears throat> and have prayer with you. And the first thing I chose, a lot of times I don't read from Psalms when I'm up here, but I chose Psalm 61 to share with you this morning. Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. <coughs> For you have heard my woes, O God. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Increase the days of the king's life and its years for many generations. May be near. May he be enthroned in God's presence forever. Appoint your love and faithfulness to protect him. And I will ever sing praises to your name and fulfill my vows each and every day. Well, I hope that you can come away with the, the one, that one of the gist of this prayer was that uh, we have to place our trust in God when we're under many great threats. And um, the threat may not be natural or life per se, but there are many other things out there that's threatening the church or our values and our systems. And then also this being February, I have to read this, this is so well known, from John. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, and that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And that's what we're all about here, I believe, too. And then also I'd like to just end with this since we're getting ready to partake of um, the Lord's Supper. <coughs> this is from John. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never come hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. And all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from the heaven, not to do my will, but to the will of him who sent me. And that's something else that I think is so strong here in the Church of Christ. So let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you so many thanks for so many blessings you've given us each and every day. Yes, a lot of times as humans, 
we become so complacent and we forget, or not, maybe not forget, we just get so busy and entangled in our lives that we just don't stop and reflect on our life and thank you enough. I hope as time goes on we will do that and we will do things here at the New Church of Christ and out in public that will be very pleasing to you. And as we're about to remember Jesus, yes, we need at this time to look inward at ourselves and examine ourselves and we know that. But also, as we look at ourselves this morning, are we really, are we growing in the Word? Are we growing in what our actions are showing people? And are we doing things that would make us proud in, in your eyes? Because I know, the Lord, you're watching us at all times, and we want to do what we for you. So as we partake in the envelopes, please remember the important things. And yes, we have to, we never can forget that horrible, terrific death that Jesus died for each and every one of us, not just a few of us, or just the ones that we think are just better, but he died for each and every one of us. So all of us, we stand the chance if we take it, but we have to set forth and make God and the Bible and Jesus part of our lives that will shine through at all times. In your son's precious name, we pray this morning. Amen. As Bob said, good morning again. Everybody. When we think about giving here at the New Vienna Church of Christ, um, this is a very giving church, and they've always demonstrated that. How lucky we are to have such a good congregation, a good group of people who are always uh, there to help people in need. And from Matthew, we see. Uh, Matthew 6, I'm uh, going Old English here with King James because I forgot my glasses, so the other one I can't see. Uh, and whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him, Twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn, thou, turn not thou away. Uh, as, we, as we read that, uh, we're reminded that somebody asked you, help, you're not supposed to turn them away. That's, that's not the Christian way to be and how evident that is. Um, we also see wherever, on farther down here, Matthew, wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So, what we have and what we've been blessed with Tomorrow can be gone, so why not use it today? I think it's what we need to keep in mind. Um, we're all never guaranteed, as Brad says many times, when you walk out that door and that can be it. So why pass up an opportunity maybe to help somebody? You may not get that second chance. Um, on farther back in Luke also, Luke 6.30, Give to every man that askest of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. We want to help everybody that's been in trouble. We have uh, people here in this congregation. We have people abroad. So when we think about giving, it's just not money out of your pocket for the church to, to run the lights. It's, it's to help real people, people who are in need. So giving is something that it will make you feel better when you do. So let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for this congregation and all those people here this morning who saw it in their best interest to wake up and be in attendance this morning to worship you. To have that opportunity to give, give back a portion that you blessed them with. We ask that you bless the gift and the giver, Father, we thank you. And we thank you so much for all that you've done so far in the, in the long history of this church. And we know that we hear about estates and, and people who pass away and, and they want to give money back, such as Betty Schaefer. Um, we can remember, those of us who have been around a while can remember Betty and uh, all that she did with the youth and, and uh, how fitting it is that uh, she would want to make sure that uh, part of her legacy would live on and uh, see that the youth programs be continued. We thank you so much, Father, for her thoughtfulness and uh, all those... Uh, uh, prior to her, you know, there's been a lot of people who uh, have attended here for many, many years, and 
have blessed this church and left money to this church. And we hope that continues, Father. And as for the young people, uh, let us set an example of what it's like, Father, and uh, what it should be uh, in a giving world. And we're better than from Christians and Christian people and the churches that we let the world see that we need to give. All these things we ask in your son's precious name. Amen. Christianity is 
Christ. Christianity is a lifestyle. It's much more than what is confined to these walls on a Sunday morning. It is every facet of our life. Living for Jesus Christ. Knowing Him more. Paul was disciplined to grow closer to Christ. And we are called to do the same. Disciplining ourselves requires us to have the same focus that Christ had. When you read throughout the Gospels, and I know Matthew, Mark, Luke, John all give a different account of, of the ministry of Christ, but read together and paralleled together, we see a committed man who did the will of the Father. And we see a man whom we are to emulate in our lives. He, he wasn't a dictator. He didn't uh, tell us, listen, this is how you need to live your life, but he did it first. When it comes to humility, he showed humility. When it comes to, to, to forgiveness, he was forgiven. When it comes to being gracious, our Savior was gracious. He asked us to follow in his steps what Christ-like means to us, being like him in what we say and do. Paul experienced Christ on a daily basis. This morning, as we said last, Royce touched on the conversion of Paul. What a change Christ makes in our lives from persecuting the church to one of the greatest evangelists in the history of mankind. A man who was switched on to Jesus and lived a committed life to him. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, to, to guide us. We need to be open to his shaping in our lives so that we can develop the disciplines necessary to live a Christ-like life. Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 is what we're going to look at every week, these next three weeks together. And I want us to look at some of the disciplines that you and I need to, to begin developing so that we can be committed to living for Christ as well. I hope and pray that as we get through these three weeks together, our prayer is what Paul writes in Philippians 3.10. That we all want to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, and to live a life that reflects who he is so that we shine our light for all to see. But the first discipline this morning that I want us to focus on, it's appropriate as Valentine's Day approaches, is intimacy. We should have a commitment this morning to deepen our relationship with God. Intimacy is a, is a hallmark of a healthy relationship. Husbands and wives, you know the importance of intimacy. And much more than physical, it's emotional and, and spiritual. There's a connection there. There's, there's a deepening of that relationship. The years you're married together, as the days go by, though there's ups and downs, you grow closer to your spouse and you love him or her. And that intimacy grows. The more you want to be around that person and, and share uh, your, you know, your life with that person and experience life with him or her. But I want you to know this when it comes to, to deepening our relationship with God. Growth is change. Relationships grow over time. Some, some don't. Uh, marriages should grow. If not, then you need to work those problems out. But growth is change, but not all change is growth. Keep that in mind. Growth is change. For instance, you didn't stay five, right? You grew up. You may stay five five, but when it comes to physically, you grow up. You, you, you get weaned off the bottle, you're no longer on Gerber's, you're eating solid food, you get a job, it's the real world. You know, you as you grow older, things change, right? Growth is change. But not all change is growth. Meaning that we approach being Christ-like and we approach Christianity sometimes with such a selfish mindset. We want it on our terms. We want things the way we want it and God should comply right away. And we change our view of things. We want to experience more. We want to feel good when we leave church. But we never base it on God's word. You couldn't point out to someone where Paul says in Philippians 3.10. Or, or, or sit down with someone and describe them the life of Paul. We need to know God's word. Whatever we feel and experience needs to be based on the word of God. Okay. Not all change is growth. Some people change for the worse. Some people regress in their faith. <laughs> and what they weren't for you think, I can't believe he's living like that. I can't believe she, she, she's made that decision. It's all a matter of how deep our relationship is with God. Do you remember when you became a Christian? If you look back when you were baptized, can you honestly say your life has changed? Right now, can you say it's changed and has it changed at all? I think we all remember when we came out of that water, there was a zeal, right? There was a desire to say, I'm going to conquer the world for Jesus. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to do the right thing. And the first couple of weeks, you are gung-ho. But then all of a sudden, that zeal begins to wane a little bit. That excitement, eh, you're kind of excited, but not what you once 
work. You see, we can't live a Christian life just based on feeling good. Because we all know the ebbs and the flows of life. Many Christians have waned in that zeal, that commitment, that spark that once was there, you know. People think, yeah, our marriage is falling apart. Yeah, we just don't have that spark. Well, it takes time and commitment to continue growing a relationship in the very way with our relationship with God. The church of Ephesus had this problem. I want us to turn to Revelation chapter 2 this morning. Some of you are wondering, where's Revelation? Last book of the Bible. Pretty easy. I like to make things simple. Revelation 2. I love the book of Revelation. Many of us get caught up in uh, the end times, and we probably all have differing views on end times. It's not a matter of salvation. I don't care what you think. I think when the trumpet sounds, they'll be ready. Uh, I don't know what you call that view. Uh, Bradfotology? I don't know. You can use that. But, um, the idea is we've got to be ready in our lives because Christ can come any moment, correct? Amen? So we have to be ready. Paul, or I'm sorry, Paul, I'm thinking Paul, uh, John uh, has this vision. He's taken up in glory and he sees uh, uh, the vision that God gives him. And of course, we see the wonderful description of what heaven's going to be like when tears, no, no pain. We have victory. That's the key to revelation. Don't get scared when it's boggled down with, with, with eschatology and end times. We know we read this book, we look at the scoreboard, we're victorious in Christ. But there's seven letters written to the churches of Asia Minor. One of them is Ephesus. And he's kind of giving a scorecard, kind of like a report card, as Christ is, is giving a, a, a report of how these churches have, have handled themselves. And we see here the church of Ephesus, and we see the same description we just mentioned. A church that was on fire for God, they had a zeal, and they were deep in their relationship. But all of a sudden, as time progressed, that zeal disappeared. Let's look together at chapter 2 of Revelation, verse 1. It says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in the right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. They've done what they needed to do. If you stop the letter there, that sounds pretty good. We would think we're not like Ephesus, but if we look at New Guinea, we think, listen, I attend church all the time. I don't tolerate a lot of bad stuff. I come, you know, uh, every Sunday morning, uh, even when the weather's not the best, and I, I keep up with my devotions weekly. I don't try to cuss a whole lot, and I try to behave, right? We think, well, that's us. We fall right in line. However, your attitudes, your actions, the knowledge you have of God's Word, there must be the love of Christ. It must be in you. So we read on in this letter and we see what Christ has to say. Verse 4. Yet I hope this against you. You've forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now we read on to this letter and, and, and throughout Revelation, both chapters 2 and 3, we see the report cards of these churches. But he says you've left your first love. They were going through the motions of religion. It's very easy to become complacent in our walk with God. It is easy to go through the motions by coming to church on Sunday morning, and we know the routine, we know when everything is done, and we take communion, and we know the prayer we give, and we hear the sermon, and we leave the motions. It's easy to do that. But they let their first love, you see, the love of Christ was missing in their deeds and their actions. This church can do a lot of outreach. And we can sign up on the sheet we can serve in many different areas. But the way we operate in life has to be motivated by the love of Christ. You see, intimacy is much more than maintaining an appearance of religion. Intimacy is saying, I'm going to be committed to deepening my relationship with God. Not just on a Sunday morning, but it is every area of my life. Whether it is my marriage, or my family, or my co-workers, or the school I attend, or the school I teach at, or whatever occupation you have. It is a commitment to say, I am going to live with the love of Christ. He will be my motivating God. The church of Ephesus is warned by Christ to return to their early love. It's an interesting contrast when you look at Revelation and then you look at Ephesians chapter 6. Where Paul writes the letter to the church of Ephesus, and he's actually commending them. For the great love they have in chapter 6, verse 24, he says, Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. This church had that spark. They were, they were in death in their religion. They were living life for God, but then that love kind of disappeared. Paul writes that knowledge without love 
It's arrogance. I like the King James that says it's puffed up. Like a pufferfish. You ever seen one of those? Sometimes we have a habit and a tendency to operate religiously, but not godly. Yes, we come to church, and yes, we, we know what we need to do, but the love of Christ does not emulate from our lives. And when Christ's love is missing, we become legalistic and heartless, and what we do becomes empty to God without His love. The church of Ephesus had become shallow and empty. I believe this morning, as believers, that we need to take note to the warning Christ gives the church of Ephesus. We need to take seriously intimacy. We need to take seriously in deepening our relationship with God and rekindle what was once there. Maybe you're here and you are still on fire for God and you are living and serving and witnessing that my encouragement to you is please, you keep up your good work. You keep doing what God calls you to do. No matter how discouraging life can be and no matter the responses people give you, you just keep on plugging away and serving the Lord. But maybe you're here and maybe you feel that what you once had isn't there anymore. My prayer this morning is that after you hear the importance of intimacy, maybe you will see the need to reconnect. Ignite that spark. Draw closer to God. And be serious in deepening your relationship with Him. There's three things that I think are important if we're going to, to be disciplined in intimacy. If we're going to be disciplined in deepening our relationship with God, there's three things I want to keep you uh, to, in mind this morning. The first is this. Intimacy requires action. Intimacy requires action. Being active is important, right? In anything. I mean, you're, you, nothing's going to get done if you don't do it, right? Godliness is important to us. A commitment to draw closer to God and deepen our faith. It requires us to take the initiative and reach out. James chapter 4 tells us that if we come near to God, He will come near to us. I, I love... Um, you know, I know I come off heartless with little kids. I like kids. I do. All right. And uh, my little niece, I got to see when I went to Louisville, and I love my little niece, Riley. We were eating pizza or eating the table. And uh, she was done. She looked at me with her plate. I was like, you have two legs. You can walk to the garbage can, you know. Right? Uh, I'm going to do it for you. Okay? A lot of us as Christians believe that we just kind of hand it out, and God will just drop it, you know. And there it is. God will do it. I don't have to move. God, we got to take the first step in faith. We know that this church has to take the first step in faith. God is waiting to bless. God is waiting to provide whatever need you face this morning. Maybe you're having job difficulties. Maybe your marriage really is rocky. And you come to church and nobody else knows it. But when you go home and those walls can talk, what are you saying sometimes? But maybe you're struggling right now in your heart. You think no one else understands. Draw near to God. Take the first step. Because I'm guaranteeing you right now, when you come near to Him, Scripture tells us He will draw near to us. It's a closeness. Hold your place and turn me to Romans 12. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. <coughs> Romans 12, 1 and 2. Paul writing, again, the importance of, of living life. It's action. He tells us to be a living sacrifice. What does it mean by that? Well, let's read Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Verse 2 is important. Keep this in mind. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect Will. A living sacrifice. If you live, doesn't living require action, right? Are we all on the same page there? I'm not a rocket scientist, but can we just nod our heads? You guys here? All right, just check. Living requires action. We're to be active, a holy and pleasing sacrifice. But verse 2 is important because he says, don't be conformed to the ways of this world. It's very easy when we lose sight of the love of Christ and how we operate that we tend to blend in with the surroundings. We tend to blend in with our co-workers. We tend to blend in in the community. And we don't stand out as the shining light that Christ calls us to. It's very easy to do that. So Paul says be a living sacrifice. But don't be conformed to the patterns of this world. But notice, by the renewing of your mind, be transformed. That phrase is important. In the Greek, it is in the present tense imperative verb. Present means now. It is going on as we speak. Imperative is a command. Basically means this. 
That inward transformation, drawing closer to God, is something that is to be constantly taking place. And that can only occur when we spend time in God's Word. Right. We have got to be a people of the book. We've got to be in the Word. We've got to know the Word. We've got to live by it. It's not enough just to read it. It's not enough just to hear it be read, but take what, what God gives you, whether through a preacher or a teacher or your pr private devotion time, and apply it to your life. Apply it to your job situation. Apply it to your marriage and your family and in your personal life. That's what God calls us to, by the renewing of your mind, being in the Word daily. 1 Timothy 4, 7 is interesting. I love the, the letters of Timothy. I can relate to Timothy being a young, timid preacher. You know, and interesting enough, ironically, he's ministering in the church of Ephesus. Paul writes to Timothy, encouraging him to, to you know, make sure you, you are aware of your surroundings. Stay committed to God. But he calls him in <coughs> chapter 4, verse 7 of 1 Timothy, to train yourself to be godly. Training requires action. In other words, what Paul is telling Timothy is be devoted to godliness as an athlete is devoted to a sport. I had an opportunity. I love tennis, and I watched the Australian Open this past week. And uh, if you know anything about tennis, I, you know, it's one of the majors of the year. It's a, a big title. And Novak Djokovic defeated Rafi Nadal in five sets. It was the longest match in final history. Five hours and 53 minutes, those guys were on the court, hitting the ball back and forth. Tennis is an aggressive sport. I mean, it requires... Endurance. There was no jogging. Every shot, those guys, it was a rocket across the court. I mean, they put everything into that match. By the end of the match, when they were awarding the runner-up and the champion trophy, they were leaning against the net, literally. They couldn't stand up. They were so exhausted. You see, an athlete gives all to his sport. Their scheduling, their time, their sport never takes precedent. It is number one in their lives. What Paul calls Timothy to do is to make sure that godliness is number one priority. You commit yourself. You eat, sleep, and breathe God. You love Him. You put Him first. You set aside a time of the day where you know at that moment, no matter what is going on, I'm drawing close to God. You set aside a time and day where you know no matter what is going on, I'm going to seek Him in prayer. I'm hitting my knees, or whether it's in your car on the way to work, you know at that moment I am drawing close to God, and I am, I am growing closer to Him, and I am deepening that relationship. Because if we want it bad enough, we'll do it. But we've got to want it. It takes effort. It doesn't happen overnight. We've got to get serious about deepening our relationship with God. Because I want you to know this morning, many people can be religious. There's not very many people who are God. It's a big difference. Intimacy requires action. And in the process, the second thing I want you to point out this morning about intimacy is that intimacy cultivates wisdom. Not only does it require action for us to want it and say, I am going to be committed to deepening my relationship, but it cultivates wisdom. We have, must desire fulfillment in our walk with Christ. Not just talk about it. Much like marriages, you desire fulfillment. There's some rocky patches, but you work those out and you grow closer because that, that tough time or that difficulty when you desire fulfillment still, no matter what's happening, you, you do draw closer. When God's the center of your relationship, no matter what you face, you end up drawing closer and that bond becomes deeper. There's more intimacy there. But it's, a, it's not enough for us to just talk about it. We desire fulfillment. But that fulfillment is cultivated. It doesn't happen on our own terms. We would love to live life with no problems at all. We'd love to wake up, and I don't know if you've seen those commercials where the guy is talking to every bad thing that's going to happen. Hey, you're going to have a hot hole at 7 o'clock. Oh, thank you. Am I going to blow my tire? Absolutely. All right, thanks for the info. That we don't get an email telling us everything that's going to happen during the day. We know that there's certain things that happen in life unexpectedly, that that's why our faith has to be strong. We've got to know how to handle it. Sometimes God cultivates us in those situations. It's those moments where we're really tested. I love what Richard Foster writes in his book, Celebration of Discipline. Because he writes, one of the big problems that Christianity faces today, and this is this, superficiality is the curse of our age. The doctrine of instant satisfaction is a primary spiritual problem. 
the desperate need today is not for a greater number of intelligent people or gifted people, but for deep people. The need this church has in New Vienna is not every pew filled. Granted, listen, I'm a numbers guy. I love that, right? Amen. Amen. I'd love for you to be uncomfortable. That's I'd love for you to not be able to sit there and see. Uh, you know, right? <laughs> God forbid you sit closer. Oh my goodness, no. It's more than numbers. What this church needs is those of us who are here this morning, many people who are deep, many people who, who want to be God. We've got to want it. Because if we want it in turn the way we live our life and we go out, people are going to see Christ in us. And maybe, just maybe, we bring somebody with us to sit next to us in that pew. And they see the commitment we have to being God. It's cultivated. It doesn't happen overnight. The deeper we get into the Word, the more we can allow God's Spirit to cultivate God's wisdom in our lives. I want you to know this. Your environment doesn't change you. Your environment doesn't deepen you. Many people will, will talk about the style of worship. I need something fast-paced. Listen, we all differ on music. That's fine. Hands, contemporary, blended. Put it in your bow, okay? But that's not going to change you as a Christian. You can like the music and it's going to sound good. Or you can like the style of service. But, 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 but at the end of the day, it's what we do with God's Word. That's what's going to change us. That is what cultivates the wisdom of God in our lives. It's allowing God's Spirit to, to work in our lives to change us. To cultivate that wisdom. It, it doesn't happen on our terms. It's not an ATM machine. And it's not overnight. Paul prayed three times in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that that thorn in the flesh be removed. He was dealing with something in life. And, and, and he's like, God, please just take it away. God had different ideas. He says, you know what, I'm going to leave it there. And he tells Paul this. He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And when you read on, Paul says, you know what? I gladly suffer the infirmities and the, and the, and the, and the, the, the hardships that I face because of God's grace. As bad as we want some things to change in life that we are facing, some things are out of our control. But it's how deep is our faith in that moment that we see God's wisdom now? I hope our debt is the same as Paul's, and we rely on God's grace, and, and have that same debt to allow the Spirit to work in us no matter the circumstances, because we become Christ-like. We, we, we develop His mind. The deeper we go, God begins to entrust with us more and more of His mind. We think like Christ. We, we talk like Christ. We live. Intimacy cultivates wisdom. When intimacy requires action this morning, the third and final thing is this. If we're going to deepen our relationship with God, I want you to know that intimacy must be intentional. It must be intentional. Intimacy, by definition, is that state of being intimate, belonging to or characterizing <coughs> one's deepest nature. Intimacy is marked by a very close association, contact, or familiarity. It's the intimacy of a husband and wife. You can tell a healthy relationship, can't you? And you can tell a toxic one. You can tell a husband and wife who truly love each other, and you can tell a husband and wife that don't like being in the same room with each other. All right? You can tell. And you can tell in how they behave and treat each other. You can't hide it. It's evident. But it's, it's, it's a familiarity with one another. Your spouse, as, as, as long as you live together, you continue learning about each other. And, and you know the way they're going to think. You know that when you do something, you know how she's going to respond. And you know when you do something like this, you know what he's going to say. You know that. At least you should. Because over time, that relationship deepens, right? <laughs> well, the same deepening when it comes to our relationship with the Heavenly Father. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, we see Adam and Eve in the garden, and we see one verse that really describes the kind of intimacy God intends to have with us. And he says this. This is a description of Adam and Eve. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now, we think immediately naked. We think, oh, physical. Much more than that. There was vulnerability. You, you were allowed to be yourself, and your heart was open. 
and you were able to, to learn. You learn about your spouse. You're not, you're not closed, right? You're open. You're vulnerable. You're there for each other. You're learning and growing. Well, God wants our hearts to be vulnerable and open so that He can give us what He wants for us. So that He can bless us in the way He intends to bless us as, as His children. To be emotionally naked and unashamed. To know, I love the Lord and I am going to be committed to drawing close to Him no matter what comes in life. Intimacy with Christ is our goal. And we know that we can't achieve it without being intentional about the way we live life. About being disciplined to make sure we are giving Him the time He deserves. Christ sets such an example of discipline during His ministry. If anybody was busy, it was Jesus. You talk about making the circuits daily. People came to hear what Jesus had to say. Whether you believed Him or not, he drew a crowd. People came because he was healing. He was giving a message of hope. There was more to what was taking place in society around him. He was willing to listen to those who were unlovable or, or deemed uh, unchangeable in society. But he had the discipline, that no matter how busy he was, to draw away and seek God in prayer. I love Luke chapter 6, verse 12. It says, one of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside and prayed. And spent the night praying to God. You can imagine Peter and the other disciples saying, Well, here's your agenda, God. You know, they open the day planner. You're going to heal a couple of people at Capernaum. Uh, you're going to speak uh, in Judea. Yeah, I'm not being facetious, of course. He drew away no matter how busy he was. And he sought God in prayer. Now, I don't know what you're struggling with this morning. Maybe it's hit you suddenly. Maybe it has been plaguing you for months, maybe years. But have you really been committed to drawing away and seeking God in His presence? To just come before His presence with an open heart and say, change me. I don't know where to go. Use me. Because I have to tell you, sometimes there's moments where we just don't know what to say. God just wants a heart. Lay it open to Him. Seek Him. That's it. As we continue reading in the life of Christ and His ministry, that intimacy is evident the night he prays in the garden three times. The, the burden and the agony Christ had to know that very soon he would die in the sins of the world. That he would face the worst death known to man. And he says in that garden, not my will, but if it be your will, let this cup be your will. And that was his prayer. Dear Lord, I know the cross was in my sight, but let's just say you have something else in mind. You have a different will. Do it. Utilize it now. But he prayed for God's will. He sought him in prayer. Christ was intentional about prayer. Christ was intentional about drawing closer to God. We must be intentional in doing the same. You see, as we continue studying together these disciplines, as we seek to be committed to drawing closer to God, to be more like Christ, as Paul writes in Philippians 3.10, to make that our motto of life, that every day we wake up, I want to know Christ, the power of His resurrection, and sharing in His sufferings, to know who Jesus is, to deepen that relationship, May we be disciplined in becoming deep people. May we be disciplined in getting deeper in our relationship. Intimacy, as we mentioned, is the hallmark of a deep and healthy relationship. You see in marriages over time. That even at 70, the husband and wife love each other as if they first met. You see over time. <coughs> And it takes time to develop that. And as time goes on, the deeper that relationship grows. It becomes rooted. No matter what happens, that love is there. That is the kind of intimacy God calls us to have. That's the kind of intimacy we should want to have with our Father. May we be committed this morning to 
deepening our relationship. Dear Lord, as we read your word this morning, and we see that, that, that verse in Philippians, Paul says, I want, I want to know Christ. I want expresses a desire. And then, as you read Paul's life, there is no doubt in our mind that he lived with that desire and sought daily to grow closer to you. Week after week, we can hear a message preached. Week after week, we can hear a Sunday school lesson taught. But dear Lord, it's what we do with it when we leave these doors. It's what we, we do when we're at our own homes. And we live our own life. Are we going to be committed to opening your word? We're going to be committed to seeking you in prayer. That is a challenge that every one of us have been given this morning. Dear Lord, may we be committed to deepening our relationship with you. That no matter what happens in life, no matter how great the tides of the storms of life may be, we are rooted in you to know that no matter what may come, We are closer to you. We seek you. Father, may we be committed this morning to having your mind, to living your life, and being Christ like. And if there's anyone here this morning that hears this message, and whether their heart is open to say, it's time I take this seriously, maybe they're here and they don't know you. And they're ignoring what's being said, they're tuning it out. Father, may they see the need they have now to make you a part of your life. That they seek you to make you Lord and Savior of their life. May this church never lose sight of its first love. And may all of us as your people seek to be intimate with you. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen. during this invitation to do so now. But God is waiting. God, God hasn't moved. He's, he's waiting for us to say, you know what, you can have my whole heart. I will live a life for you. You know what, I'm tired of living life in sin. I will give my life to you and become a Christian. I don't know what to do. But I want you to know this to me. I love being here as a minister. And, and I love preaching teaching. I, I love you. I do are my family uh, here in Ohio. I'm not going to cause this church to grow. I can't make you want to draw close to God. I can't do it. I can't put a gun to your head. I can't force you. I can't speak eloquently to talk you into thinking that's a pretty good idea. I can't do it. You have got to want it. You've got to want to deepen it. My prayer, and I'm in the same boat as you, that we want to be deeper in our relationship with God. Whatever need you have, will you stand as and sing up the invitation? Will you come as a sing?
to see you all, to be back and keep in mind the announcements that have been made. There are so many opportunities to serve uh, and get plugged in. Ladies with the busy bees or, or helping out. I know the, the, we've had a great turnout so far, Ken, with the, the, for the Voice of the Martyrs. I know a lot of people have had uh, things brought in. If you check the back of your bulletin, the things that are needed, you can be a big help in a little way for, for some people who are really suffering for the faith. They are living Philippians 3.10. And we want to remember our brothers and sisters who uh, every day are, are, are facing death, literally. And here we are in these nice views. Um, <laughs> keep in mind this. Um, maybe you think, well, Wednesday Bible study, okay, 6.30. Sunday night, we have service, 6.30. And you, you don't attend. Uh, just ask yourself this. Where else then during the week are you getting Bible study? Where else during the week are you fellowshipping and getting what you need? Good question to ask yourself. We'd love to see you. Plenty of opportunities to have you. And so keep that in mind. Uh, if there is nothing else, is choir practice tonight. Uh, 5 o'clock at Mount Olive. Those who are part of that in the Eastern Kentucky. Uh, keep in mind the prayer list. Denise, I know, getting ready to have surgery. So we want to keep her in our prayers. Um, Sunny is recovering still. So we want to be mindful of that. And then many others in the prayer list. Things like that. But if there is nothing else, John, Paul, would you close with the prayer list? Lord, you're truly awesome, and uh, Lord, I'm just thankful that, that you're in control of all things, Lord, and uh, Lord, that's truly a blessing. Lord, uh, help us as we seek that, and we see that, that Brad starts talking about this Sunday, and as we, we continue to search that, Lord, to search that out, Lord, just help us to uh, to invite you into our lives, and to fully cling to you, Lord, and all of you. Lord, uh, bless us this day as we seek to serve you, as we get out, and uh, continue our worship.